the one. Patricia asked me if I would get started, uh, so I figure I'll just roll right into it. If you're here for the decompression sickness lecture, you're in the right spot. Wanted to give my bias, my background. Uh, basically, this is the financial disclosure portion of the CME portion of this lecture. I'm a former retired special operations officer for the US Navy. That was me about that long ago. I decided that uh, I would move on to a different career, uh, but I do receive income from that. I sit on the ABS committee, uh, special committee for building and classing undersea systems and uh, hyperbaric vehicles, or hyperbaric systems. And uh, that is a non-paid position, but I do sit on that board. I am a one atmosphere suit pilot, and that is a one atmosphere suit. So coolest thing and the coolest job I've ever had in the Navy, I was in command of that, and it was uh, a lot of fun. But I'm a PhD candidate at the University of South Florida, biomedical engineering or medical engineering. We just changed over to it. And um, I'm all but dissertation, and I've been all but dissertation for like six months, and I'm dying. Uh, I'm also, financial disclosure, the director of the Undersea Oxygen Clinic, as well as the International Board of Undersea Medicine. So uh, I receive financial input from that. So short of that, my life is just about fun meter pegged way over in the red, having a good time. Here are the terminal objectives for this lecture. By the end of this lecture, you're gonna be able to better understand the symptoms of decompression sickness, how they present, and, and more, more poignantly, the new observations that we've had. We all know the classic ones that you probably learned in medical school. We'll go through the current most theory and talk about the different uh, diving maladies that are coming up in the new, when guys are using, guys and gals are using these different types of uh, diving equipment, we're seeing different maladies pop up. And we'll review some physics and physiology. I know it's not, there's not gonna be a test and there won't be any questions. Patricia told me that I don't have to ask you anything, so that's good news. Brief history of diving. Uh, basically, the purpose and intent of this slide is to talk about how long it's been around. You know, we're talking about 3000 BC. We were diving for sponges. We were diving in these, uh, these caissons. And basically, uh, people have been trying to get underwater for a long period of time. We've known about decompression sickness and diving disorders for probably 1,500 years. We didn't know what to do about it. And we learned what to do about it in the 1800s. So as far as recognition of, uh, of actual uh, societies, the Undersea Medical Society was built by a bunch of Navy guys like me that, uh, that were finding decompression sickness problems. And uh, in 1967, the Undersea Medical Society was born. It uh, changed its name to the Undersea Hyperbaric Medical Society in what is that, 90, in 86, sorry in 1986, and then this organization was formed, my organization was formed by a guy named Dick Wachowski in 1996. Uh, and what he saw was a need to train physicians in hyperbaric medicine. UHMS doesn't train physicians in hyperbaric medicine. Individual companies do that, and that's basically what my company does. So, a review of what our air is. I'm sure you guys remember air is about 79, 21% of uh, nitrogen to oxygen ratio, but there are some other gases in there, such as carbon dioxide and you know some water vapor, a little bit of argon. What I wanna do is go over one of the basic laws. Now this seems like it's, uh, I don't wanna to get too, uh, too much into the weeds here, but Boyle's Law is an important law for us. And basically it says, hey, if you're gonna pressurize something, you're gonna condense the volume. So you're gonna make it, you're gonna make those little dots of nitrogen squeeze into a smaller space. That means that if I go down to 33 feet, I can hold twice the capacity in my lungs that I would normally be able to hold. That's important to us on the way up as well as on the absorption side of the house. So there's two methodologies there that we need to deal with. One is Henry's law, and that's the absorption, and the other is Boyle's law on the way up when everything expands. So on the way up, when, when the volume expands, right in the center, you see something on air volume. So the air volume is going to basically, as you go down, it's gonna get cut in half. That's the condensed portion of it. On the way back up, see the column on the right, that is gonna double in size. Those are your pulmonary overinflation syndromes. That's where that's gonna come from. The shallowest recorded depth for a pulmonary overinflation syndrome is three feet. So, uh, that's not a lot of difference. It's not a lot of delta P when you think about it. So um, just as we talk through this, and I'm gonna get into the, uh, to what we're gonna see in just a second, but as we talk through this, you need to remember the slide and remember the delta in the, 
on the way up, the doubling in pressure, and on the way down, how it condenses. You see how you get all the way down to 132 feet and you get a lot of compression. You squeeze a lot of bubbles in. So what that means is you're breathing at 132 feet, you're breathing five times the normal pressure, five times the, you're exposed to five times the amount of the inert gas. That inert gas goes into the tissues more, gets pressed into the tissues harder and faster. So just keep those things in mind as we press through the, uh, through the rest of this. I wanted to discuss what they mean, what uh, the Undersea Hyperic Medical Society means when they say decompression illness. So decompression illness is defined as decompression sickness and the pulmonary overinflation syndromes or all the extra alveolar air. So th those categories are two separate, but the distinction uh, in, in the name, I wanted to make sure that people have that. It, it's commonly misused, but uh, it's, it's one of the, uh, one of the tenants that we need to go through. I'm not gonna tell you much about this type stuff, but uh, certainly a uh, mediastinal emphysema or a subcutaneous emphysema manifested by a hole in the lung, where that path goes, the air, uh, the gas will sit right behind the sternum or it'll come up here in the neck. Interestingly enough, I give this lecture a lot. Interestingly enough, I was in Plow and the guy said, oh yeah, we, we see subcutaneous emphysemas all the time, we just, we just pop them. I said, what? So you, you, you pop them? He's like, oh yeah, all the time, okay. So I, I suggest against popping them, but you know, I'm not a medical doctor, so you guys. And then uh, tension pneumothorax and pneumothorax, I'm sure that uh, that's something that you probably see traumatically here uh, regularly, but in diving, sometimes we see them. So one of the things that we wanted to mention. And then here's the biggie. Here's the one that we wanted to focus on, at least from, a, uh, from an immediacy of care standpoint. When you're talking about uh, arterial gas embolism, rupture of the alveoli, and that path gets into the, uh, gets into the um, cardiovascular system, and the next stop basically being the brain. Pump straight up, and these bubbles grow with respect to Boyle's law. So they're gonna double in size. You go from 33 feet to the surface, they're gonna double in size. That's a bad, that's a bad scene, because that those bubbles can have a very destructive path. So, while we don't treat any of the other symptoms in a recompression chamber, this is one that we do. Because you, you don't want to take somebody, obviously, you don't want to take somebody with a compromised uh, air system or a compromised air, airway and put them in a recompression chamber. Why? Well, because there's the, the possibility of that becoming a tension pneumothorax or the gas being forced somewhere else where we don't want it to be forced. But because of immediacy of care, we put these people with arterial gas embolism in the chamber. A lot of times I get a question of, so what's the difference in symptom manifestations? Arterial gas embolism will normally manifest itself within 10 minutes of surfacing after a dive. So when you're doing your Q&A, you're doing your, uh, your H&P on somebody, you're going, okay, when did these symptoms come on for you? Oh, well, like five minutes after I got out of the water, I started feeling dizziness, lightheadedness, and you know, some patchy paresthesia in my arm. Oh, okay, so you're thinking arterial gas embolism. It doesn't necessarily matter, but you know, because the differential on arterial gas embolism and decompression sickness is so so close and you're gonna treat both of them anyway, but it's just kind of a, a differentiator in your head if you're, uh, if you're looking that way. So I wanna talk a little bit about decompression sickness at this point. So decompression sickness is largely speaking uh, bubbles that are formed with respect to Henry's law. Henry's law has to do with absorption you can absorb all that inert gas into your tissues. Remember the chart in the center, you got five times the amount of gas or more, depending. There are divers that are out there right now uh, that are doing 300 foot dives on a regular basis, 400 foot dives. The guys at the St. Pete Open spearfishing tournament, they are, they are literally in the middle of the Gulf. They're 100 miles offshore and these, these people are doing you know three, three plus 100 foot dives and coming back up and they're going, hey, why am I bent? Ben, because you, you pushed it a little bit. So I want to talk to you about a, a little bit about decompression sickness and, uh, and a couple of the, uh, the tidbits that I've learned over the years. So if you ask a lay person on the street, hey, w what causes decompression sickness? They go, I, I don't know. I think it has something to do with bubbles. And then you'll ask maybe a, a dive master or somebody reasonably knowledgeable. And they, you ask them, hey, what, what's decompression sickness? And they'll tell you about shaking up a soda bottle and opening it up too quickly and the bubbles coming out of solution and going all over the place. And okay, that's, that's kind of a reasonable answer. And then you ask maybe somebody very technical, maybe, maybe even a physician. And they'll talk to you about, you know, 
uh, phagocytes and leukocytes and uh, bonding around and macrophage, eating, trying to eat the bubble. And I'll tell you about stripping away the endothelium lining and leaking of the basement membrane and all of that goodness. And you go, okay, well, that's the current most theory, sure. And then you talk to the four or five people in the world that really understand DCS, the Bill Hamiltons, you know, the Bruce Winkies, the guys that, you know, have a lot going on upstairs when it comes to bubble physiology. And you ask them what causes decompression sickness. And say, I don't know. I think it has something to do with bubbles. So if we knew what caused DCS truly, we'd be able to fix it. So, you know, we'd be able to prevent it, right? Because we're all about prevention. So truly, we don't necessarily know what causes it. It obviously has something to do with bubbles, the number, the location. Uh, you guys probably see PFOs here pretty regularly. Um, I'm seeing a lot more PFOs lately. Um, like I said, it depends, on, it depends on the number of bubbles and the individual. I've seen people with Doppler scores that are off the charts, a rolling drumbeat and, and continual, and they don't have DCS. And I see somebody that's got like a Doppler grade of two, and they're bent. So, is not a close correlation to the Doppler score that you get or the bubble score that you get, bubble count, and DCS. So, But what we've seen is, hey, look, we know when the symptoms come, we know they come in this pattern and then the next step and then the next step. So we've seen this, and the progression of symptoms is what we've seen. So this is based on a, a paper that uh, uh, Mitchell, uh, Pyle, um, Sadler, and I wrote. So this is all about tiers of symptoms and, and the clinical patterns that we've observed. Every single one of these starts with these, headache, lethargy, and nausea. Now, obviously, these are nonspecific symptoms, and they can be characterized by anything. By God, he's on a boat. She's on a boat, and she's nauseous. Okay, that might be seasickness, but it, it may very well be a, a predetermined of something that's to come, right? So. But every time we go back and we Q&A somebody who has been bent, they go, well, you know, it started with my belly just not being right. Or it started with, I was so exhausted when I got done with that dive. I just had to lay down and go to sleep. And remember, these people are coming out of the caves in North Florida. So it's like they'll come out and there is no nausea. There is no motion that they're going through while they're on the boat, you know. So when they step out onto land and they feel nauseous, hmm, you know, we should be thinking. And, and certainly headache has been a driving factor. Yes, sir? We have divers that come in with symptoms other than these, but when we ask them and we, do, and we trace back and we pull the string, they always say, oh yeah, you know, I had a headache when it first started. It went away. But I, because when I got out, I drank a whole bunch of water or I came out and so this is just what we've seen over the course of, it was several hundred, uh, several hundred patients, the, you know, but it was a retroactive study. So it's not like it's perfect, but just trying to identify the, uh, the path. All right. So tier two symptoms, what we see is lymphatic DCS or um, uh, swelling asymmetry here, 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 here. Um, and we'll see these things start to swell up. And that, that seems to be the complement system reaction. That's at least the current most theory. Uh, we'll see that. You'll know, or you should know, that when you compress these people, the pain associated with the swelling in the lymph nodes will go away. But the swelling won't go down for three, four days, maybe even as much as a week. So musculoskeletal pain, that is the classic DCS number one symptom that we see is is pain, and the pain is, is very, it's a specific kind of pain. So when we think pain, obviously, from the paramedics, we think OPQRST. So the key being, if you had to describe the pain, where is it? And what somebody will say is, they'll go, I don't know, it's, it's, it's in here. If, if they point to something, if they point right here, that's a, I hit my elbow on something sort of a pain, right? It's, it's not a, I hit my knee, I bang my knee, and I can point right to that pain. Generally speaking, that's not DCS. From what we've seen, it's, it's just an aching internal pain that can't be pointed to exactly. So these are all good information. Uh, like I said, the provocative factors. But the time of onset, that'll cue you to a POIS or a DCS, depending on the time of onset quality of the pain, any radiation, uh, severity, and the time. All right, generalized rash. So here we see cutis marmorata, 
um, orange peel looking skin. We see this with pitting edema. We see it without pitting edema. Sometimes that pops up. And, and what we'll find is women will take it here in the midsection and in the um, buttocks and thighs. And the men will take it in the midsection and over the chest and shoulders. So generally speaking, it's in the fatty areas, right? The adipose tissue, they call it the fat bends, but you know, um, if, if somebody has this type of stuff, I have seen things go very badly, very quickly from cutis marmorata to tier three symptoms. So if you have somebody that has a tier two symptom of you know, a, a rash or a generalized cutis marmorata, you definitely want to take some action pretty quickly. And I'll, I'll go through those actions in just a second. Uh, subjective sensory changes that are, that are obvious to the person themselves, the diver themselves. Those are the tier two symptoms. Now here's where we get into the seriousness, the, uh, the tier threes. This is all about immediacy of care. If somebody rolls into the hospital at this point, you should be thinking, oh, what's, what's going on with this person? So uh, obvious changes in consciousness and confusion, difficulty with speech, slurring their words, walking imbalance. I tell a lot from somebody's gait, how they're, uh, how they're doing. Sensory loss, that's obvious to the examiner as well. Uh, weakness and paralysis of the limbs. Um, and what you'll find is on the weakness scale, you know, you'll do your, uh, I'll get to the neuro in just a second, but the tier threes further is bladder dysfunction, inability to urinate, inability to defecate. Uh, and loss of coordination or control of the limbs and definitely shortness of breath. We've seen shortness of breath a couple of times. Shortness of breath is manifested by um, what we term as profuse intravascular bubbling. What we think is people come up so quickly and all those bubbles are coming out of solution so quickly that you air bind the, the lung mechanism and, and you have a bunch of air bubbles surrounding the, uh, the alveoli uh, producing an inefficient gas transfer. So they, sensibly they can't breathe. So, all right. These are some of the factors that affect uh, the uh, hasten the onset of decompression sickness. Dehydration being the largest one of them, uh, so obviously the treatment, the, the current treatment is uh, IV. What else? The workload at depth. You can tell the spear fishermen when they're working, when they're chasing down a fish, when they're doing something, you know, underwater that's, uh, that's a pretty big deal, they'll, they'll get that, uh, they'll manifest earlier. Uh, PFO, like I said, the biologic predisposition, that's certainly it. I am not here to tell you anything about neuros. You ER people probably have forgotten more about neuros than I know. But I want to show you just a couple of highlights here. What we find is if you're doing a, uh, if you're doing a mental history and, and they can state the situation, you, you don't need to go into the memories and all of that. I mean, you know, if they can basically state the situation, we stop there when we're doing our neuros. So, Take that for what it's worth and, uh, and go from there. As for coordination, like I said, I can get a lot out of just a person's normal gait. I can, I can see what's going on in their, uh, in their lower extremities by that. As we're testing the cranial nerves, um, yeah, oh, I wanted to hit on pupils. So pupil dilation, uh, scopolamine patches. People are using scopolamine patches for anti seasickness. I don't know if you guys have seen this or know it, but I've seen when they apply it and then they rub their eyes, they get a blown pupil, which is really, really bad. And you look at them, you, oh, you know this. <laughs> You've done it, <laughs> okay. Um, so that's one of those little tidbits of information that I said, oh, wow, that's, uh, we gotta be careful about that. So on the strength side of the house, when you're doing your neuros, if you're not in the upper 10% of that person's strength, you're probably not gonna find anything DCS related, unless it's like complete, you know, completely uh, flaccid. Um, and then uh, sensory changes, uh, basically gross, gross sensory uh, is, is generally good enough. Um, and then obviously, once we do the gross overall and they find some deficit, then we do the all arounds. So deep tendon reflexes, if you found nothing in the first five, generally speaking, you're not gonna find anything in the deep tendon reflexes that, that will show you anything about DCS. So. Just FYI, once again, I, I think you guys probably have forgotten more about that than I know, but just some tidbits. So what do you do for decompression sickness? Well, first thing is oxygen and IV fluids. We don't use dextrose, we don't use D5W, we don't use any kind of uh, normal saline and rigorous lactate to, to rehydrate somebody. Uh, bolus, you, you definitely wanna have them well hydrated and on oxygen. 
We use the, uh, we use the Sapayan position. We don't use Trendelenburg anymore. This, I thought we had kind of killed this in the, in the early 90s, but it's kind of made a, a re resurgence, if you will. Uh, it just doesn't tend to be very comfortable for the person as they're making the ride back from you know the boat to here or to get to you guys at this point. So, and early recompression is a uh, is a desired trait if you can get there from here. So, everybody, we are at the Undersea Oxygen Clinic, and there are basically two places that do 24/7, 365, answer the phone and treat your diver. One of them is here in Tampa, and that's the clinic that I own, and then the other one is in Miami. Now, there are plenty of places that will treat divers if they happen to be conveniently bent between the hours of nine and five and all as well. So, you know, and, and I think, I, I don't think, I know you guys have a recompression chamber here, and I hope the guys aren't here throwing darts at me, but uh, they treat, but they don't treat divers here. They'll treat diabetic foot wounds, they'll treat osteomyelitis, gaseous gangrene, that sort of thing. Uh, and, and that's fine, but you know, the 24-7, 365 places, there are only two of them in this state, and two of them that are registered with Dan 24-7, 365. Dan is Divers Alert Network, by the way. So we've had this question come up from, uh, from the St. Pete side. Well, what about Intala laws? You're just a clinic. And I said, you're absolutely right, we are just a clinic, but it's, it's generally speaking, not a transfer. If the patient is well enough to be let out of the hospital, okay, I'm gonna discharge this person, I'm gonna discharge them just like I'm gonna discharge them to ortho or discharge them to somewhere else, here are the orders, you're gonna go find a, uh, an orthopedic clinic later, you're gonna go find a, uh, you know, somebody has some sort of a tooth problem, you're gonna assess them, fix them, take care of them at that moment, and then discharge them, say, oh, go see a dentist, you know, tomorrow or the next day, follow up. Same thing with us. So it's not necessarily a transfer, it's a, uh, it's a stable outpatient for us. I don't take anybody that's on a ventilator, I can't, I'm not a level one trauma center, I'm a clinic. But you're gonna discharge from here and then they'll get picked up by a physician there. We have physicians on call 24-7, 365. That's a great schedule to work out, it's like herding cats, so. Um, we are a local resource if you guys have any questions on diving, diving hyperbarics. Uh, like I said, we're manned 24-7, 365. We also do this, we also do a training course for physicians. I can issue 40 AMA1 CMEs if you're interested from the UHMS. So uh, the MOAs is something that for me, it, it, it kind of rings truest and I can understand it a little bit better when I discuss it. But arterial gas embolism and decompression sickness both the mechanism of action for the, uh, for the drug oxygen is hyperoxygenation, as well as decreasing bubble size. So the hyperbarics, as you press down, it will squeeze that bubble, make that bubble smaller. So whatever those bubbles are, if bubbles have anything to do with DCS, then it'll make them smaller. Uh, so basically the clinic care, uh, patient selection, if somebody has had a dive, you should consider that they might have decompression sickness. Obviously, they're not gonna be in the ER if they don't have a problem, but you know, you have to do differential, right? You have to, they bang their arm on the boat on the way up sort of thing, okay? A uh, delay in treatment obviously causes long symptom, uh, longer symptomology. So they may not recover from that paresthesia. They may have that numbness and tingling in their arm, their leg for the rest of their life. And that's the kind of stuff that we see with delay of treatment, so. Uh, we also do carbon monoxide poisoning, and this for the firefighters uh, and, and arterial insufficiencies as well. Uh, in other words, we're still on call 24-7, 365, so if the place that you guys have doesn't treat carbon monoxide um, issues, we are there, and, and same with arterial insufficiencies. But these are all about immediacy of care as well, as you probably well know. Uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, uh, Patients should definitely be treated with hyperbaric oxygen. You cut the half-life of carbon monoxide by like, uh, I don't remember the exact figure, but it's, it's staggering. It's uh, down to 23 minutes from hours. Um, so so you cut that, uh, that half-life of carbon monoxide down and you get, them, you get them well oxygenated again. Same thing with arterial insufficiencies. If you have a problem uh, with arterial insufficiencies, that immediacy of care within 24 hours of onset of, uh, of the arterial occlusion, you can, you can definitely get some good, uh, good feedback on it. So really well repaired. 
That was all that I had, unless you have questions for me. That's our phone number if you're interested. Yes, sir. I beg your pardon? Free divers. Yeah, um, so free divers get bent. It happens, uh, especially when they're doing repetitive deep breaths. So they'll take a breath, they'll go from the surface, they'll drop down, they'll spearfish, they'll do whatever. But when they're doing that sort of thing all day, uh, yeah, number one, they get really dehydrated, and number two, they absolutely can get decompression sickness. Interesting fact, whales and dolphins get decompression sickness all the time, and they free dive a lot, so. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so what we see is we see an increase in the incidence of decompression sickness, but a decrease in incidence of pulmonary overinflation syndrome. So these the people that are diving mixed gases and diving deeper and staying longer, generally speaking, they're better at buoyancy control, they're better at, uh, you, you don't have those pulmonary overinflation syndromes that you have. But the problem with helium, so, as you descend down and you go to those five atmospheres and there's five times more gas and it pushes in five times faster. When you switch to a gas, helium, that uh, eliminates nitrogen narcosis, it goes into solution 2.67 times faster than nitrogen does. Much smaller molecule, but the lipid solubility dictates that there is no narcosis effect. So this is great for the anti-narcotic potential, but it's really bad for the decompression sickness side. So yeah, we do see an incidence of that. And the bends that we see from helium tends to be that adipose tissue, which is really slow to fill normally, but when it goes in you know, two and a half times faster, you, we see big problems. We also see a, uh, a lot of inner ear DCS, the staggers. So the inner ear DCS, somebody will have that walking disturbance, that balance, that, uh, that problem with their vestibular process uh, where that helium can get into the, uh, the inner ear, and that's, a, that's generally speaking a big problem and takes a lot of multiple recompressions to get there. But, uh, yeah? Prevention. Yeah, so we would love to be able to prevent it. Once again, we, if we knew exactly what caused it, we'd be able to prevent it. But what we find is that well-hydrated divers are the best at preventing decompression sickness. You know, the tables are basically, most of these tables were derived based upon a Navy diver. And a Navy diver was 18 to 24 year old male in great shape. So, you know, we have an aging population of divers, so as the population, I had an interesting case present a couple of weeks ago, a 70, 70, 70 something year old guy, finally retired, him and his wife, they go out, they do four, five, six dives a day, they shoot fish, and you know, this is, this is what they're doing in their retirement, and they go, okay, you guys are not 18 to 25 year olds, come on, you gotta put a little bit more conservation in there, so uh, as, as you get older, as you have some of those biologic predispositions, or age comes into effect, you're a little bit heavier, your workload's a little bit higher underwater, you add a couple of safety factors, add a little bit more time to your schedule, or, or decrease the time that you're allowing yourself to be underwater so that you don't get affected or hopefully don't get affected. But once again, you can do everything absolutely right according to the tables and be the most fit person in the world and still get bent. So it happens. It's one of those things. Did I answer that? Great. Anything else? You guys are a really easy crowd. Yeah. Oh. More. Right. Right.
Right. Right. So what we wind up doing is um, we, we try and do lectures like this for local dive clubs. It's, it's the recognition of those symptoms and when they need to start to worry. Uh, I don't need you to run to the hospital every time you have a headache after you dive. That's not the case. But I want you to recognize that if you have a headache, you should be super hydrating yourself. You should get some food in your belly and you should kind of start to get yourself in a position where you think about where you're gonna go for the next step. And then if the tier twos start to come up, because they do, they progress very well. When, when we talk about the old DCS type one and DCS type two, none of that has anything to do with progression of symptoms. None of that has anything to do with increasing uh, severity. So we, that's why I stopped talking about that and I start talking to dive clubs about recognition of the early onset symptoms. So it, it's a tough nut to crack and like I said, you're you got to go an hour offshore before you can even get to 30 feet of water. So, yeah, and then by the time you get from the land to here, it's, it's two and a half hours, you know, and that's, that's with a really good EMT group getting you, getting you right to the hospital right away. So, but here's what really happens. They wait until nighttime, like 10, 11 o'clock at night, and then they go, you know, I don't really feel well. And then they roll up into the ER at you know midnight or one, and, and then they call us at like two or three. So generally speaking, we're treating people from like three in the morning to, to six in the morning. So that's, that's always fun. Any other questions? Well, we're a resource, we're right here. We're on West Shore between the two malls, right after you get off 275, right on the right on West Shore. It's the Fast MD building. And, uh, and if you're interested, we can talk to you about uh, training in hyperbarics, but uh, we're here as a resource if you want to use us. So thank you very much.